Welcome, everybody, and uh, I hope everybody is having a, a great morning. Has got themselves a cup of coffee, and will enjoy some of our lectures today. Um, we've got six lectures today. Um, they range from about forty-five-ish minutes or so, and we've built in some some time, a little bit of time for if we run a little bit over or a little bit short. Um, so I hope everybody can stick around as the day goes on. If not, I always will ask a couple questions at the end of the speakers. Um, but if you, as the day goes on, if you're still on there and 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 you want to ask a question, please use the chat option. Um, I will be happy to, you know, if you don't, if you put it in the chat, I'll basically ask the question. So, you know, if you if you don't want to come off mute, just put it in the chat. Even if it's in the first two minutes of the lecture, we'll get to them at the end. I, I love great questions. So, uh, and then I don't have to come up with all the questions, but I would love for here some of you guys uh, input. So thank you so much for being here today. This is our 10th annual symposium uh, when the fairs came to town. Um, I look back at the coming up in just a couple of weeks is the 140th anniversary and the 40th anniversary of the 1984 World's Fair. Um, these are really pivotal moments in New Orleans history, um, and we're going to learn a lot today. So I hope you guys take advantage of this, either if you're you're watching home at a later time or you're watching it live today. Um, thank you for being here, and we, we hope you enjoy this. Uh, let me add one person. Um, our first speaker is going to be doing an overview, and um, I think this is a great way to set us off for what we're going to be talking about today. Um, our first speaker is Dr. Charles Chamberlain. Dr. Chamberlain is a professor of uh, public history at the University of New Orleans. So, Charles, I want to welcome you today, and thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Jason. Can you all hear me? Yep, we can hear you great. Okay, great. Thank you, Jason. Um, always great to be here. Jason often invites me to do the introductory lecture for the annual symposium. And um, welcome, everybody. Um, and this symposium is going to be a great one, uh, covering a very interesting subject of the two world's fairs in New Orleans history, in many ways very different, but also some similarities. So I'm going to go ahead and minimize the gallery here and just dive in. And um, the way I've set it up is basically I'm going to be skimming along the surface of the topics and then um, I'm covering all of these um, subjects within this historical theme that all of the different presenters are going to be diving down deep into. So um, again, I'll kind of provide the introduction. So here we have the introductory slide um with images from the 1884 world's fair on the left and then the 1984 world's fair on the right so um, um i want to start off really kind of giving you the context of early world's fairs to help set up um the first world fair in new orleans the cotton exposition of 1884. so in the brief history and overview um Initially, World's Fairs were a real free-for-all in terms of who could host and who decided to host. There was no regulation, and they began in the 1790s. The first one was essentially an industrial age promotion um, by the host nation or region. Um, the first one in 1790s was um, in Prague, Bohemia at the time, before the Czech Republic, for the coronation of Leopold II. Incidentally, Mozart composed his last opera for this one, uh, La Calamenza de Tito, for the occasion. But by the early 1800s, Paris began hosting several all in a row, and then they began popping up all over Europe in Turin, Italy, and Naples, and London, and Genoa, and Dublin, and Birmingham. The first American Expo uh, occurred in New York in 1853. And then Philadelphia hosted three in 1858, 74, and 76, really promoting industry. And then they began to spread out geographically by 1881. Milwaukee hosted an industry one. Atlanta hosted their International Cotton Expo, which I think probably inspired New Orleans. Um, but 1884, the year of our Cotton Exposition, the first World's Fair in New Orleans, actually coincided with 12 other industrial expos internationally, just to show you uh, what a free-for-all it was. So Boston hosted one on manufacturing, Nice, France, an international expo, Amsterdam on agriculture, London, an international expo, South Kensington, UK on health and education, Cape Town on industrial, Durban, agricultural industry, New Orleans on cotton, 
Melbourne, Wine, Fruit and Grain, uh, Edinburgh, Forestry, Turin, General Expo and Adelaide Industries. So um, very different from what develops in the mid 20th century, as we'll see where it becomes more regulated and everyone has to apply formally. So here are some images just to kind of show you some of the original World Expos. This is the Paris Exposition, uh, Exposition of Industry in 1801 in the courtyard of the Louvre, just to give you an idea. Um, here's a couple images from Philadelphia in 1876. This is an exhibit by the German manufacturer Krupp, which at that time made arms. Now, of course, they make um, coffee makers, so many of y'all probably have a Krupp's coffee maker. Um, this is also Philadelphia, 1776, obviously recognize the arm of the Statue of Liberty, promoting that uh, sculpture, which um, came to America not long after that. And here's an image of the Atlanta Cotton Expo from 1881. Again, um, I believe it inspired um, the cotton growers of uh, Louisiana to really promote the idea of New Orleans as a cotton center in competition with Atlanta. So um, the context of New Orleans in terms of preparing for this Cotton Expo, um, and I would um, basically encourage you all to read R.A. Kelman's A River in Its City, Chapter 4, Triumphs in the Cause, really talks about this whole effort, the context of the return of the port after the American Civil War. So <clears throat> up to 1860, New Orleans was one of the top ports internationally up there, believe it or not, with London and New York in the top three. So then during the Civil War, the Civil War, the naval blockade had a negative effect on shipping in the city. Um, so the city lost essentially 70 to 90 percent of the valley trade as it bypassed New Orleans, as railroads also grew exponentially during the 1860s and 70s. So in the post-war recovery, um, New Orleans um, commercial interests faced the realization that the railroads were essential combined with the engineering feat of the Eads jetties. And this is where um, an engineer, Mr. Eads, uh, built jetties at the mouth of the river to make it easier for ships to come in the river and basically scour any sediment deposit to prevent the buildup of a sandbar. Um, and so the Cotton Centennial Expo was considered the vehicle for advertising the city's economic comeback. And then here's some contextual images of the city during this time. The, the famous Thomas Hardy map of 1878. And the reason I show this is because it shows the upper city park, which it was known at the time. Now Alderman Park up here, the green rectangle uptown um, before it was officially designated as Audubon Park and obviously um, about eight years before the, uh, excuse me, six years before the Cotton Expo. Here's the famous Edgar Degas image of the New Orleans Cotton Exchange in 1873, um, really again um, 11 years before the Cotton Expo, but showing the context of New Orleans as the center of the cotton trade um, and also the international commodities market was based out of New Orleans. Here's another image showing the riverfront, showing all the steamboats that every fall, um, October and parts of November would bring the cotton bales from upriver down to the city to be offloaded and then transported internationally um, to cotton mills in especially the UK and New England. Here's another image of New Orleans from this time from 1884. This was actually used as a promotion for the Cotton Expo. And if you notice, this is a very famous image. Um, I mean, most of the background you can see Mid-City and, and Jefferson Parish and the lakefront is all undeveloped. But if you look uptown, they are actually depicting the Horticultural Hall and um, the Expo up where Audubon Park is. And of course, a bird's eye view, it's not exactly accurate. It's really meant to more convey New Orleans as a bustling port and then promote the expo uptown. So in terms of the cotton exposition, here's some of the facts. Cotton Planters Association promoted the initial idea. Again, I think it was based on the fact that Atlanta had hosted their fair in 81. Um, so pre-Civil War, a third of U.S. cotton exports came from New Orleans. New Orleans was home to the Cotton Exchange, established in 1871, and therefore an international commodities trading market. By 84, 
Um, it was um, basically the 100 year anniversary, of the first recorded shipment of cotton from New Orleans to England in 1784, of course. And this reflected the connection of New Orleans and cotton to the Industrial Revolution and the birth of the British cotton textile industry, of which um, the United Kingdom was uh, really the top most industrialized nation based on cotton textiles. So in terms of planning the expo, um, there, of course, in Louisiana politics and history, um, uh, some scandal and corruption involved. So uh, I'm not going to go through all the details. I'm going to go through some of the highlights here. But in 1882, the National Cotton Planters Association proposed the idea. It was then promoted into Congress. So Congress, U.S. Congress, then decided to fund the startup for it. Um, so the National Cotton Planters Association appointed state treasurer Edward A. Burke as the director general. Um, and then he succeeded in getting more funding from Congress. Uh, essentially $300,000 and uh, for the construction of a U.S. government at State's Exhibit Hall. And then um, basically $5,000 was provided to each state and territory for representation in that hall. Uh, so Burke expanded the focus to become more international, um, which is really one of the greatest legacies of the Expo. Um, but due to financial failure of the Expo, Burke resigned from the directorship amidst accusations of financial misappropriation. Surprise, surprise. He made friends with President of Honduras along the way and eventually relocated to uh, Honduras permanently, in essence, to avoid accusations of impropriety. So uh, part of the scandal of the preparation for the expo. So now I'm going to present some images of the 1884 expo. Um, here's a promotion for it with a bird's eye view of the city showing um, development and also the specific buildings that were developed for the expo overall. And now we're going to um, look at the ground plan. So on the left, you have the Mississippi River, and this would basically be the, uh, the rectangle of most of Audubon Park from St. Charles Avenue on the right to the river on the left. And you can see um, some of the, the main um, features would be the main building, A, right here, um, and then the U.S. and state exhibits, B, over here on the right, bottom right, Horticultural Hall on the bottom left, the Mexican building, which we're going to get to, is D right here, and then you have other art gallery, factories and mills, livestock, furniture pavilion, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the kind of the general layout uh, from that time. And so here's the Times Picayune's depiction of um, all the featured exhibits and halls as they existed at that time, including the Great Hall right here at the top center and the Horticultural Hall down here in the middle, two of the biggest halls they have. So here's the main building, uh, and this is essentially facing kind of upriver if, um, if the building stretched perpendicularly along, say, Walnut Street would be behind it, um, and then this is looking basically towards um, the upper river from this angle right here. And you can see kind of a, a Beaux-Arts style um, architecture, huge hall, and basically a giant frame with lots of glass to house all the different exhibits. Here's another image of the, um, the various halls. So again, the center would be the main building that I just showed. We see the government building, which was the B, the U.S. and state exhibits the horticultural hall on the right, uh, art gallery, and then the Mexican building on the bottom right. So here's another very interesting uh, depiction of it with tourist boat landing at um, essentially the fly, what is uh, the front of Ottoman Zoo now, um, and then stretching back through Ottoman Park, you can see how large the, the Great Hall was essentially. And uh, again, here's the main entrance on the downriver side of the horticultural hall. Here's some actual photographs of that site. It's hard to believe that Audubon Park and um, the golf course is really the location of this today. Um, but all these buildings were removed. Um, here's another interesting depiction of the Horde, excuse me, the Great Hall looking again kind of upriver. Um, you can see the wind is out of the south from the West Bank, blowing the flags in the smoke. And this is a really interesting depiction which I would like to focus on for just a minute. And so this is a colorful depiction 
um, of Uncle Sam and the Queen of the South welcoming all of these women who represent different Latin American nations. Um, so you can see the depiction of all the different costumes of these ladies. Um, so really, um, the, um, the text that accompanied this image is called Peace, Harmony, and Trade with Latin America. And so Uncle Sam and the Southern Queen welcome the ladies representing Mexico, Brazil, Cuba, Peru, La Plata, which would be Argentina, uh, Chile, Haiti, and Ecuador. And then the poem that accompanies it at the bottom says, Now peace has done her perfect world serene, loyal, and beautiful. The Southern Queen bids all the wide world welcome to her door where industry has spread a varied store. Where the white splendor of her heaping bales answers the snow of crowding foreign sails, why, sister, blessed be thy welcoming hand stretched to republics of the tropic land. So they're trying to make a, a poem that alludes to essentially the way that New Orleans was trying to promote trade with these Latin American nations in the Caribbean and further south in Latin America and South America. And this has, of course, been um, a very strong cultural connection New Orleans has maintained with Latin America historically all the way since the original colonial period and into the 20th century. Um, so very interesting depiction of that promotion. And indeed it does really come to fruition in part because of the growth of the coffee and banana trade in the early 20th century, um, not just cotton. Um, anyway, I'm just gonna show you some more depictions of the horticultural hall here. Uh, this is a little bit of a fuzzy image. Here's a better one. Um, and so depicting people very well dressed, of course, this is the Victorian era, and this is when people would go out in public dressed very, very nicely. Um, and so here's some images of the various exhibitions that uh, existed. This is actually the Alabama exhibition showing, of course, cotton, right? So some of the southern states were going to be promoting their cotton growth. Um, here is a stereographic view of the fountain in the palm court in the center of the Great Hall. You can't really see the palm court very clearly here. And of course, this is the area, the, the era, excuse me, of stereographic images where you look through this lens um, and then it conveys the idea of a three dimensional image. So here's a close up of it showing this beautiful fountain. And again, all the guests dressed in their Victorian gear. Uh, costumes of the day. Here's an image of the great music hall in the center of the main building where there were performances done and uh, including the Mexican band, which we're going to get to in just a minute. Um, here's the reception of Rex at the music hall. So uh, receptions like this to promote the idea of New Orleans as a carnival destination. Um, and then Here's the image uh, depicting the entrance to the Mexico exhibit in the main hall. So um, Mexico becomes one of the most important of the Latin American nations to be presented with their own hall. Um, and so this presents basically the minerals of Mexico um, in various sculptures and different artistic presentation. Um, here's another one. This is J.M.P. Coates' exhibit at the Cotton Expo a structure made of spools of thread, kind of a novelty idea, showing a building, again, made, in, uh, made of spools of thread. Here's the Edison Electric Light Company exhibit. Um, they had one of the four contracts to light the expo. This is right when the 1880s was when electricity became more common in New Orleans, especially in the CBD area. Um, the streets were beginning to be lit electrically, and then, of course, the more developed neighborhoods, the wealthier neighborhoods, would also be getting electricity during this time. So promoting the idea of um, common consumption for lighting and power. Here's the locomotive ex exhibit. Um, this is the Belgium exhibit is to the back right. Show you, again, the interior of the main hall, how large it was, very tall. Uh, made for exhibiting huge structures like these locomotives. Here's the Hey No Tea Company exhibit offering cups of tea. Uh, I'm so promoting tea. And now we get to uh, the Mexico exhibit. So um, outside of the Great Hall on the riverside was um, basically what was known as the Alhambra Palace. 
And um, basically, uh, a man, Gilberto Crespo, was a distinguished mining engineer from Mexico. Um, and it was filled with, again, minerals of rare beauty and value. Two rings representing minerals and arts from each stack of Mexico, iron, zinc, copper, lead, gold, silver, and opals. The outer ring contained an array of shrubs and plants native to Mexico. And I have seen images, I could not find them for this presentation, of a railroad car delivering some large agave plants. So anyway, this is a depiction of the Alhambra Palace. Here's some actual photographs of it you see to the left and then on the corner of the building to the right. Um, and then here is an image of the Alhambra Palace when it was reconstructed in a park in Mexico City. And so here's an image of it today. So um, it really conveys how beautiful the building it actually is. So now it's a kiosk in the neighborhood of Santa Maria La Ribera. And it's known again as the uh, original Mexican Alhambra, restored at the Almeida in the center of this park in Mexico City. Um, so very interesting trivia in terms of recycling part of the exhibit um, into a kiosk in modern day Mexico City. But really that brings us to the legacy of the Mexican band. And um, I know I think there's going to be an entire presentation on this subject. Um, it's fascinating to me as a professor of New Orleans music history, and so I promise not to go too deep into it, but um, it was a very popular draw in the era of John Philip Sousa, and part of the legacy is that members stayed, they became well-respected musicians, um, they often played at West End, these musicians, all the way into the 1890s and the early 1900s, so a huge legacy. And also there was what is known as the Mexican series uh, published by local music publisher Junius Hart. Um, this is at a time period when New Orleans was essentially the Tin Pan Alley of the South. We had a publishing industry, music publishing industry here. So Junius Hart published what was known as the Mexican series, a number of songs that were very, very popular. If anyone is interested in reading more about it, um, jazz historian Jack Stewart wrote a series of articles for the Jazz Archivist. Uh, the publication of the Hogan, Hogan Jazz Archives at Tulane. These are available online. But quickly, I'm going to kind of go over um, just um, some images of the band itself and part of the legacy. Here's one of the most well-known images. Uh, the leader was Encarnacion Payen. That's him to the right. Uh, the official title of the band was the 8th Cavalry Mexican Military Brand, Band or Brass Orchestra. Um, and this was actually a time when Mexico was ruled by dictator Porfirio Diaz, who had his agenda of industrializing the nation. So he thought this would be a great opportunity to promote Mexico also in terms of industry. Um, and so here's an image, a uh, close-up image of the, um, the illustration on the cover of the jazz archivist and showing Payen, the, the director, uh, inset to the right. Uh, here's some images of some of the sheet music from the Mexican series, which you can see thematically. It shows the United States flag and the Mexican flag with the nopal, the cactus theme in the middle. Um, and then, indeed, the, the song El Nopal was one of the most popular songs um, promoted in that series. Now, part of the legacy also is the emergence of the popularity of the song Sobre las Olas, Over the Waves, uh, by Mexican composer Juventino Rosas, pictured here at the right with his violin. Um, there's the Junius Hart Publishing House on Canal Street at 1001 Canal. Um, and here is a beautiful uh, depiction of the sheet music in Spanish for Sobre las Olas. Again, it translated into English, it was Over the Waves. Um, and I don't really have time, unfortunately, to play the videos um, of the performance. But um, let me just sing the melody really quick and state that um, especially people of the baby boomer generation or older grew up uh, listening to this music as the soundtrack to the flying trapeze. And so the melody was, but it's considered one of the classic waltzes uh, from Mexico during this time period. Juventino Rosas considered one of the great composers of that time period. 
There's two videos that I have here for anyone who wants to have access to this later, but one is the Orquestra Sinfonica uh, of Mexico, and the other is an uh, excerpt from a movie uh, by Pedro Infante. Um, sorry, I'm going to have to keep going here. Um, so part of the legacy in terms of after the fair closes that Audubon Park has developed following the plan of John Charles Olmsted, the older brother of Frederick Law Olmsted, who's uh, credited with developing Central Park. Um, and so when they dismantled all these buildings, this is when they developed what we would call modern day Audubon Park and Exposition Boulevard on the downtown side of the park is really one of the legacies of the expo in terms of names. There's also the, the large uh, chunk of iron ore in the middle of the golf course that um, is also one of the leftovers. And I'm sure um, the coverage that's gonna go further down deeper will cover more of the leftovers and the legacies from the fair. Now that brings us to the, uh, the modern era of World Fairs leading up to the 1984 World's Fair. So, big change happened in 1928 at the Paris Convention. Um, there was a basically an effort to order the domain of international expositions by regulating their frequency and defining the rights and responsibilities of organizers and participants. As we said, in 1884, there were probably, well, I think, 14 different fairs going on internationally. So, 1931, the Bureau of International Expositions, BIE, um, began an operation. They emphasized education, innovation, cooperation, no longer just a showcase for industrial innovation. They really wanted to emphasize using these fairs as a global platform aimed at finding solutions to the biggest challenges of humanity. Now, some of the modern ones that we might be familiar with were the 1939 New York Expo, 1962 Seattle, where they created the Space Needle, 1967 Montreal, hence the baseball team, the Expos, uh, 1968 San Antonio, where they created the hemisphere structure. Um, but by the 1970s, they were starting to fade. There were only four Expos. Um, and then in the 1980s, again, not that many, only eight Expos. And generally raises the question, why the decline? Um, mostly because of expense. And so it was the realization that expos achieve only modest, modest tourism and economic boosting goals. Um, but that does bring us to the New Orleans World's Fair, which occurred from May to November of 1984, titled The World of Rivers, Fresh Water and a Source of Life. So it was based on the 100th anniversary of the Cotton Expo. Uh, it was built on the 84-acre site chosen on the riverfront of the warehouse district, cost $350 million. Feds, the federal government granted $10 million. Louisiana granted $5 million. Uh, they had to the basically, basically raise the rest privately. Um, it, it basically had $7 million guests, which was less than expected. Um, and part of the problem was it came two years after the 82 fair in Louisville. It was also competing with the Olympics in Los Angeles. Um, so it was considered an economic loss and failure, and it was actually the last of the world affairs in the U.S. But um, as we'll get into, the lasting legacy was the infrastructure development that came with the 84 World's Fair. So in terms of the origin and roots, we have to look to the 1960s when the Council for a Better Louisiana, a group of business leaders, had their goals of revitalizing the New Orleans economy and tourism. New Orleans was feeling insecure in terms of competing with other cities like Houston and Atlanta that were growing much more rapidly and had larger populations um, and businesses were moving to them. So they wanted to bring new investment to the city. Um, they also wanted to get federal and state money for a new larger convention center, which I find ironic because Rivergate, which was built at the foot of Canal Street, you can actually see it in the background here, this wavy building, was brand new, but it was already outmoded, believe it or not. So um, they wanted to revitalize the derelict area of the riverfront along the warehouse district. And so in 1976, the nonprofit Louisiana World Expo um, exposition was formed to plan. They sought funding and applied to the BIE for a fair in 1984. And here you see this image of the World's Fair site under construction at that time. 
Uh, you can see the, the white kind of skinny line is the monorail coming through. This is the, the construction of the big hall, which became the convention center. Over here at the right is where the river walk was. So here's some contextual images of New Orleans leading up to the 1980s to really show the state of the warehouse district as it was in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. So here's a satellite image um, before they even built the GNO Bridge. Um, and so here's the warehouse district right here. You can see Canal Street coming down. Um, and you can see it's all wharves and railroad sheds on the riverfront. And then here's the warehouse district. You can't see that clearly, of course. We're going to kind of dive in um, as we go along. And then here's another image of the riverfront uh, where Canal Street came in, where essentially they're going to build the World Trade Center and Spanish Plaza. And you can see, again, typical of the riverfront at that time. It was all covered wharf sheds that were built really around the turn of the century as a progressive era business move to protect commodities as they were offloaded um, in New Orleans. And you can see how small the CBD was. Uh, the Hibernia Tower was the largest building at that time. Oops, sorry. Um, and here's a map showing um, the warehouse district at this time. Again, you might even recognize, not, not recognize some of the street names, Water Street, Delta Street, uh, South Front, which is now Convention Center Boulevard. So they did have to remove a few streets. Um, and you can see the railroads, this is the public beltway, still exists, but they had to scale back the railroad in general. Now, here's a great image of the warehouse district from probably around 1960, I would say. And if you're looking for any landmarks you can identify, um, it's almost Im impossible to kind of get your uh, sense of bearing on what is the warehouse district today based on this image. But I will show you down here, if you can see where the cursor is, that is the corner of Julia and Convention Center Boulevard, where, say, Moulots is today. If you see that cursor, right? So Julia now s basically spans backwards uh, away from the river along in here. If you look here, you can actually see the um, the Julia Row back here, these um, these townhouses. And then some familiar other buildings might be, this would be the CAC back here and the Woodward White Building down here. And then this intersection right here would be Magazine and Julia where today you would find um, Pesh Restaurant, where at that time you would have J. Aaron Coffee Company headquartered in the Pesh Restaurant building. And that was at a time when that was Coffee Distributors Row and people were roasting. And if you rode through there, you could actually smell the coffee roasting back then. Um, and then a lot of these buildings have now been completely transformed into condos or restaurants, or some of them have been torn down to make modern hotels. So here's an image of the that intersection, which I just described, of Julia and Convention Center Boulevard. On the left, you see it's probably around, let's say, 1980, maybe. You can see the plaza office building in the back left. But you can see how run down the warehouse district was at that time compared to what it looks like today, of course, on the right. Here are some images of the site undergoing construction. So at this point, they had basically cleared um, a lot of the railroad tracks and the sheds and the warehouses from that area in preparation for building um, the convention center, which is uh, the grade hall for the fair. So by now, we see that they had taken that area, that this was all cleared out in this image, say this is probably 1980, um, and this is not long before the fair opened, so maybe 1983, they had already built the Great Hall, which is the convention center, and they had built the walkways that would then go to the river walk, which um, again, those are wharves that were cleared out, and you can see at this point, the, weir the wharves are demolished. Um, and they're also starting to clear out some of the area just up river from the convention center. Um, and so here is an image of um, what the fair looks like at the time of the opening, essentially. And you can see now the river walk has been built, the convention center has been built, and I will go to the maps now to show you kind of depictions of the different areas. So here's the kind of the classic cartoon or, or excuse me, illustration depiction 
of um, the World's Fair. It's almost cartoonish in the way it is. Um, and then here is the official map that the World's Fair produced. Um, you see the different neighborhoods, and we'll go over those in just a minute, but the black uh, squiggly line is the monorail that they installed. And so essentially we have the Great Hall, which is this area right here, uh, which is the convention center. And then along the riverfront, we have what becomes Riverwalk. Um, and then over here we have Bayou Plaza on the upriver side. And then we have um, the Festival Park um, and the area uh, that is on the backside. And then Fulton Mall, which Fulton Street still is one of the legacies of that. So on the map, they have the six neighborhoods. Some of the highlights include uh, the Bayou Plaza, that's the one upriver. Had the Aqua Amphitheater, the Cajun Walk, and the Kids Wash Garden. Festival Park um, had the Federal Fiber Mills and also was a center of nightlife and entertainment. The International Riverfront, which is today's Riverwalk, showcased the United States and international cultures. Fulton Mall, which is still the way it is today. It was a center of nightlife with bars, clubs, and restaurants, including Pete Fountain's Club and the Vatican exhibit, which was um, kind of an oddity for that part. Centennial Plaza in the center was an homage to the 84 Cotton Expo. Um, and then the Great Hall, which is today's convention center, was known as being an air-conditioned hall, which included the Louisiana Pavilion and with a simulated boat journey through Louisiana's wetlands. Um, some of the other highlights were the Wonder Wall, which was a big structure that was meant to hide electric cables along Convention Boulevard, but basically an artistic structure. And then the Mississippi uh, area, Aerial Rapid Transit gondola, which went across the river to Gretna. And here's an overlay of the map today uh, showing where these sites would be based on um, today's geography. I'm not going to get into it too much. It's uh, basically repeating what I said before in terms of the river walk on the front, the convention center where the Great Hall is. Uh, Fulton Street, um, and then the, the Fair Festival area over in the Warehouse District, and then the Bayou Plaza just upriver, which is now part of the Convention Center. So here are some images showing uh, the World's Fair as it was. And so here's the upriver entrance. Uh, basically, you're back on the left. You're looking at this image. The ba your back would be to the bridge, so you're facing uh, the, the CBD area. And then here is Seymour D. Fair, the pelican mascot. Um, and I suppose you get the cheesiness of that name, Seymour D. Fair, get it? Ha -ha. So um, one of the controversies were the mermaids that greeted visitors at this upper entrance. And so some people objected to the depiction of these women, essentially because they showed their naked breasts. Um, but Gene Nathan, who the, was the spokesperson for the World's Fair at the time, said they're based on classical artistic sculptures and they should not be offensive to anybody. And if anyone recognizes Poseidon there on the left and the alligator, um, those are now located at the corner of Chapatulis and the, the road leading to Mardi Gras World in the port of New Orleans. And so those were actually salvaged and are on display today. So um, this was also the summer of the Republican National Convention in New Orleans. And so here's images of Seymour de Fair meeting with Vice President George and Barbara Bush. Um, incidentally, Ronald Reagan didn't really want to take the time to go to the World's Fair. It's apparently the first time in U.S. history that a president had declined to go to the World's Fair to do the, the, the shaking and greeting. But in this image right here um, with Vice President Bush, you see Governor David Treen at that time. And also behind him, you see uh, Dutch Morrill in the background on this image to the left. So Dutch Morrill was, of course, mayor at the time. So here's some images of the fair. We see the monorail in the foreground, um, the hemisphere, sorry, the, um, the Ferris wheel that was one of the largest in the world at that time. Um, of note, also, you see the second span of the Crescent City Connection under construction at that time. Here are some images of the MART gondola, which was essentially designed to be a long-term 
um, commuting project with the idea that people on the West Bank would love to commute via gondola to the CBD to work. Um, obviously, that didn't really work out, but it what did provide a great aerial view of the fair at the time. And many of y'all who may have gone to the fair undoubtedly took the MART ride. Um, and so here's some more images of the MR MART ride. Um, here's an image of the U.S. pavilion showing the Enterprise, the space shuttle at that time, and also the, um, the three-masted Coast Guard ship docked on the river. What I think is interesting about this image is, again, it shows how everyone was dressed up for the fair at that time. This is still at a time, even in the early 80s, when people would dress up to come to events like this. So, um, with time, and I believe I have uh, five or ten minutes, I'm going to play you an excerpt of the promotion video um, that tourists would see when visiting New Orleans at the time. But I think it's great because it captures the kind of the, the live atmosphere of the fair. So here we go. And uh, as the video has introduced, introduced, it says that the quality is not the greatest, but it still conveys well what the fair was like. The 1984 Louisiana World Exposition. In New Orleans, we just call it the World's Fair, and believe me, there's never been anything like it. The shows, acts, and exhibits, the thrilling rides, the architecture and fantastic food and drink from all over make this a very special place. One you and your family will want to explore inch by inch and as often as you can. The fair offers fun for every age group, much included free with your price of admission. Be sure to check today's newspaper and to watch updates on the local TV stations for all the latest on what's happening at the fair today. And here's a tip. Don't forget to wear your most comfortable shoes. You'll love the rides, but make sure you'll be able to enjoy walking, too. One place you'll want to run is Creole Country Cottage, which stands along the Wonder Wall and near the Space Shuttle. You'll sample delicious Creole and Italian sausages on sticks, as well as tasty Italian sausage sandwiches. The Creole Country Cottage near the Shuttle also serves stuffed potato skins. Both serve icy beer and soft drinks. As you stroll the Fulton Street Mall, you'll find eateries and drinking spots of every sort and description. One of, if not the most popular pubs is Sheila's, a delightful bit of down under right here in New Orleans. You'll find fun, friends, great drinks and food, as well as live entertainment from 6 p.m. on. Australian bands can often be heard here, and you'll always find plenty of Frosty Foster's beer at Sheila's on Fulton Street. Right nearby, the whole family can enjoy our video excitement at Bally's Aladdin's Castle. Here are all the newest video games, including the laser disc creations. You'll find all the old favorites here, too, from Ms. Pac-Man to Ski Ball. And at Bally's Aladdin's Castle, you can win souvenirs and prizes and play till 2 a.m. in air-conditioned comfort. Kids love it. There's so much to see and do here, it's sometimes hard to figure out what's next. While you're thinking, we recommend to stop at the Kid Wash. It's almost as much fun to watch as to be washed. Be sure to catch a ride on the monorail. It's the perfect overview of the fair and great fun besides. You know, all of the fun of the World's Fair isn't right at the fair. Did you realize that you could take a scenic sightseeing adventure right from the gondola? Mississippi Aerial River Transit, better known as MART, is a unique gondola system which spans the Mississippi River for 3,600 feet. Each support tower stands 360 feet high, offering a spectacular view of the entire city, the Mississippi River, and the world's fairgrounds. It's an unforgettable ride. And there's more fun awaiting you on the west bank of the river. Stop off at the... Okay, so I'm going to stop that there, but um, I think it does give a good sense of what the fair offered and also the general atmosphere of the fair. Um, I also wanted to note that if you noticed at the intro, they were advertising some of the featured musical acts and all of the signs that I've seen that said Lou Rawls and Ray Charles, for example, 
have been really <laughs> amazing performers. So um, I think the fair actually, actually offered uh, a chance to see some really amazing international talent in New Orleans at that time, and also provided a lot of work for local musicians as well. So um, coming to the conclusion of the 84 World's Fair, it was deemed a financial failure, and I have this in quotes, um, but then with long-term legacy of revitalization. So by November 84, the closing of the fair was 100 million in debt with losses over 120 million, ouch. Um, but the long-term legacy saw many, many positive gains. And so it continued to revitalize the riverfront and as, as an extension from the moonwalk, which was the first area of the river to dismantle a shed and then allow public access. And that was in 76. So here we are, what, eight years later. Um, and um, so now the riverfront is now extending further up. Uh, it expanded tourism capabilities. Um, provided, of course, a new convention center and Riverwalk Mall, revitalized the warehouse district, um, led to the construction of new hotels such as the Windsor, the Weston, the Holiday Inn, the Sheraton, and also new condos and restaurants. And here's an image kind of showing the before and after. The bottom would be the warehouse, probably warehouse district in the 70s or maybe 60s. You can see the sheds and the big railroad yards. And then you can see this whole area is now transformed into the convention center and the river walked. Um, and now, of course, the hotels and restaurants that exist there. So in conclusion of examining the legacies of the 84 Cotton Expo and the 1984 World's Fairs, uh, they're both short-term loss but long-term gains. So uh, looking at both of them, they both lost money. Uh, they were considered financial disasters in the short term. But in terms of long-term gains, uh, the 84 Cotton Expo affirmed the trade connections with Latin America, had a musical impact on the city with the legacy of the Mexican band, which continued all the way up into the early 1900s, uh, including an impact on the early jazz era. And then also cotton trade continues with New Orleans as the center. And I do point out this image of this mansion on St. Charles at Balance to the right, that was built um, by the president of the New Orleans Cotton Exchange, who essentially in, uh, I think, 1898 or 9, cornered the cotton market globally. And with that money, he then was able to build this mansion. So um, the effect of the cotton trade was positive for those at the top of the industry. In terms of 1984 fare, of course, emphasizing it revitalized the warehouse district and expanded convention tourism. Um, New Orleans is still one of the top convention towns in the United States, and it's a pretty competitive world. But we do have to face the fact that if it were relegated to Rivergate, it would not have that potential. Um, but in conclusion, of course, the 84 World's Fair represented the end of the World Fair era, the last one in the U.S. Uh, and then here down at the bottom is a depiction of the warehouse district, uh, Chapatulis. Um, from 1948, again, just showing how different it was back then. So that is it for the introduction. Do we have any questions? Yeah, let's, um, I kind of want to focus on the 84 World's Fairs. Um, you talked about that it had, I mean, obviously the, the impact of the 84 World's Fairs is, is, is still today, uh, 1984 World's Fairs. Um, but, um, you mentioned that there was about a hundred million dollar loss or was it 120 million or it was a hundred million dollars in yeah. debt. Yes. Was that financed through a corporation or was that through the city? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I, did, I think the city did put up some in terms of infrastructure development and they certainly paid for, um, you know, emergency services and sewer line capabilities and all that kind of stuff. And interestingly, Dutch Morial was not really behind the World's Fair initially. He was reluctant. Um, and I do know that they repaved the French Quarter. I know some people were actually a little bit upset, the fact that the French Quarter used to have cobblestone streets. And then with the World's Fair, they paved over a lot of those cobblestones. Um, so I'm not sure exactly. Um, I know there are figures 
for how much the city put into it and how much it may have lost. But back to your original question, the 100 million to 120 million, a lot of that was raised privately. Um, and uh, so this was what the nonprofit Louisiana World Expo organization was intended to do, was to raise the funds for the fair um, with the idea. And again, the promise was big. Oh, we're going to have, you know, 90 million visitors, not 70 million. Um, everyone's going to come back all the time. And, and one of the things they didn't anticipate was in buying a season pass, they actually lost money because season pass was cheap. People would go all the time. The ticket sales just didn't reach the, the level which they anticipated. So, um, could you clear up uh, two myths that I've always heard? I, 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 they may be both true. I think they both have some root in them. Uh, that uh, two legacies yeah. of the '84 World's Fair were French Quarter Fest was created, and the hand grenade came out of the World's Fair. I, I'm not sure about the answer to either one of those. It wouldn't surprise me, honestly. Um, I do know that the French Quarter Festival was begun, and gosh, I can't remember when the first year was. I'm sure someone out there can. Um, but it was basically by French Quarter business owners who were concerned there wasn't enough tourism coming to the French Quarter. So they decided to stage a free festival to bring tourists, which is unbelievable to think about now. Um, and, you know, I mean, the history of the French Quarter is a, is a story in itself. Uh, in the 1970s, it was still kind of uh, an old school neighborhood with a lot of mom and pop businesses. And then by the late 70s, early 80s, it began that transformation to be the tourist center, the Disneyland effect that we have today. Um, but, yeah, those are great questions. In terms of the hand grenade, I don't know. We'll have to do some research on that one, Jason. Thank you. Um, let me see what I have here. And if anyone uh, I, can quickly do that research and chime in, <laughs> I'll be more than happy to to verify if, that. If, if someone comes up with it and remembers it at the 84 World Sir, please let us know. It's obviously grown into a huge business that probably has eight to ten bars, and, pot, and they also make their own uh, mixes and all that stuff like that. So uh, that's what I've always heard. So um and, and I just wanted to point out the Lou Rawls and the Ray Charles. I mean, the amount of music yeah. that was played at the 1980 World 84 World's Fair was unbelievable, yeah. and it was a it was it was a nation. You know, it was it was not just New Orleans music, and that is you know a, a, an unbelievable part of the uh, of the story of the 84 World's Fair. Yeah, no, I agree completely. Um, and a lot of that was featured in uh, you know just daily performances where someone like Ray Charles and Lou Rawls we mentioned. Um, I think those were the two featured performances of that day, you know, so I mean, just incredible. Um, the the still image I have of that entrance shows Don Williams, who's the a popular country music singer at that time, but also a guy who could fill stadiums. Um, so I mean, they, you know, they drew a wide array of talent in a broad array of style as well. So it would actually be very interesting to go back through the newspapers and see, or any kind of promo promotional information to see, uh, and make a um, you know a, a composite list of all of the different music performances that were offered at that time. And uh, very, yeah, two people just already already uh, sent me, uh, and the Derek just put it in the chat. Uh, is that the Tropical Isle hand grenade came directly out of the '84 World's Fair? There you go. Thank you, Derek. Oh, uh, he also asked us, do you know when the monorail came down? Yes, uh, the monorail came down right after the fair, and um, it is repurposed at the Miami Zoo, from what I understand. Oh, nice. Oh. Yeah, and and I didn't really get into it, but some of the artwork from the fair was uh, placed in different areas around the city. There's one sculpture, for example, that's in City Park along the Big Lake. Um, there's a, um, a house on, um, Wisner at one of the bridges like Mirabeau, where it has some of the sculptures. Um, you can see it as you're driving along the bayou and, um, there's other sculptures that are still around as well. Well, fantastic, Charles. Thank you for giving us a great overview and setting the stage for the rest of the day. Um, what is going to happen now is I'm going to put everybody quickly into the, uh, into the, 
the waiting room, just real quickly, uh, Derek, our next speaker, and I are just going to go over, make sure he's got all his information, everything ready, and if we have any technical issues, and then I will let you guys right back in, and then we'll get back started again. So great talk, Charles. Thank you so much. Thank you all. All right, Jason, great to, to be here. Thank you for having me, and um, I hope you all enjoy the rest of the symposium. It'll be great. Can't wait to hear Derek's uh, presentation, too. So. Fantastic. Thank you, Charles. All right. All right. We'll see everybody in just a few moments. Okay.